All right, welcome. So who of you is already invested in Bitcoin? Hands up. And who doesn't want to admit he's invested in Bitcoin? <laughs> Who's, who has only heard of Bitcoin but really hasn't bought any yet? Only very few. Would you mind sharing why you're at this conference? Like, are you here to learn about Bitcoin? Yes? You consider buying Bitcoin? Cool. Welcome. So all the others, you obviously already invested in Bitcoin. So what the fuck are you doing here? Like, you already know what this is about. Someone wants to share why he is at this talk? I would be generally interested because most of us are already Bitcoiners probably for years. Why, why are you here? What are you trying to take out of this? Interesting. And what, what do you expect to get out of this uh, Client. half an hour? Clients. Clients. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got you. So this is going to be about how to invest in Bitcoin. Now, I obviously knew that all of you guys already invested in Bitcoin, so I tried to make it not uh, too boring, but try to take the perspective of newcomers, right? Because you are all Bitcoiners. You probably love Bitcoin. You, you want to share you know, a Bitcoin, you want to uh, talk about Bitcoin to everyone and get any, everyone in to this new monetary system. So this is usually what we get wrong as Bitcoiners. Like we get it, but then we are really bad in explaining others how to invest in Bitcoin and why to invest in Bitcoin and how to get them to understand Bitcoin. We're usually very bad in this. So there's always a problem and a solution. And we always try to go and convince people about a solution when they didn't even understand there's a problem. Like, we go and say, hey, you know, you buy Bitcoin, it's decentralized and so cool, and there's only 21 million of it, and everyone's like, what? I have a credit card. I have money on the bank. It works. Like, shut the fuck up, right? So let's try to take the perspective, and today, if you have already invested in Bitcoin, you don't need to learn how to purchase Bitcoin. Let's try to figure out how to um, explain new people, newcomers, how to invest in Bitcoin. But first, we need to uh, look at this question. Who is this young guy, and what the fuck is he doing on stage? Um, I'm actually not that young. I'm, I, I turned 30 <laughs> in December. Bitcoin keeps me very young. Um, I'm from Switzerland, small uh, village with like 400 people, so probably more cows than people live there. Um, but I kind of made my way to Bern, where I studied business administration and psychology, to Zurich, where I founded three companies. I'm in Bitcoin since 2015, um, trying to be an entrepreneur. You can reach me on uh, Twitter and uh, LinkedIn. And I founded uh, Bravis, which is the middle company in like 2018, because I thought I need to tell uh, banks and asset managers how to invest in Bitcoin. and. How, how they get their clients uh, to invest in Bitcoin. Uh, it was not a really good idea as a 25 years old to try to tell uh, these old bankers that don't know about any of this anyway. But I tried, I keep trying to do advisory and consulting for big banks uh, in Switzerland. And then we founded CCFE, it's called Certified Crypto Finance Expert. That actually worked pretty well because what bankers love is diplomas. Like they want to very in a very like only three days. They don't want to take a lot of time to understand anything, but they want a diploma that says, "Hey, you've understood it." And it said, "Oh, you you can get a diploma. It's, it costs a fortune, but they're willing to pay." And after three days, they can call themselves certified crypto finance expert, and they could put it on their CV and their LinkedIn. They really love this. Uh, so this is still going in Switzerland as well. But what really excites me right now is that I'm. Uh, working with Relay. Relay is Europe's easiest Bitcoin app made in Switzerland. Imagine you can download an app and within one minute and from 10 bucks already, you can buy Bitcoin, you can set up a savings plan in Bitcoin, and you also have your Bitcoin directly in your non-custodial wallet. Within one minute, you don't have to register KYC, AML, verification, nothing of that. And you can do it 24-7 and instantly. You can even use your credit card or Apple Pay or Google Pay. So it's the really the easiest way how to buy Bitcoin in Europe. So let's just do it. 
Huh? You're here to invest in Bitcoin, so you can all take out your phone, download Relay, and within one minute you can buy some Bitcoin. Joke. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like This is usually the reaction of people when they first learn about Bitcoin. They hear it somewhere on the television or they, they uh, have, read something on the newspaper and then say, Oh, I want to know. Invest, but like, when should I buy? When should I sell? Fuck the, the the price is so high. I probably need to sell, or I need to buy or FOMO or whatever. They always think about buying and selling. They never think about wait a minute. Should I actually understand this first? That's what Warren Buffett called uh, coined when he said, "Look, uh, if if I don't understand it, I don't invest in it. And if I invest in it, I want to be in it for ten or more years. If I don't want to hold an asset for ten years, I also don't want to hold it for a day." Right? And so to come to this conclusion that you want to invest in it in something and hold it for a decade, you should probably first understand it. And that's what we as Bitcoiners have as a task to tell the newcomers, because we are uh, in a group of around 10% of the world. 90% doesn't know about it, hasn't touched it yet. And we are basically also tasked to inform them and educate them about it. I want to try to help you uh, doing this. So the first is al always why. If there's no reason, why should, why, should they, why should people do anything? There's always, there always needs to be reason, there needs to be purpose, there needs to be a problem. So in order to use something, to use a solution like Bitcoin, you first need to understand the problem. And most people don't understand that we even have a problem with the financial system. Now they start understanding it, especially in Germany. Uh, when it gets colder now and they have to heat their homes and all of a sudden it costs three times as much to heat their homes. All of a sudden uh, a sausage costs, you know, 15 bucks or a, or a, a durim costs like 10 bucks. It was uh, half, half the price a couple of months ago. And so inflation rates, especially in Europe, are as high as they haven't been for like 50 years, 8 to 10% in Europe is like 12% for GBP. It's like 10% for USD, which by the way is the world reserve currency, you know, supposed to be stable. Um, but it's going down 10%, like the, the value of your money, that's what you can tell these people. You have your, your money on your savings account and the value goes down 10% every year. So within around seven years you have lost half of your purchasing power with your money so you can buy half of what you actually have saved for uh, within a time frame of 10 years and at the same time that we have record inflation we have almost zero interest rates yes now they're hiking a little bit but what ideally the ideal world would be you have some inflation but you have even higher interest rates so net you are positive what's happening now is that net you're negative a couple of percent because there's almost no uh, interest rates and remember beginning of this year like half a year ago the european central bank we're supposed to trust them to manage our money right they have said they have a target of two percent inflation they want to keep it so they wanted us to believe and to trust them that Inflation will keep at 2%. Now it's at more than 8%. How do they react? They're like, oops, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you're you know, you're going to gonna be poor. Uh, it's fine. They, they don't care because they're rich. But most of the like, people in, in the middle class or lower class, they're fucked. And they're fucked by central banks and our financial system. And once people understand that problem, that actually the whole world is, is burning in terms of inflation, there are some countries like Turkey, for example, that are even worse, like South America, Asia. Most of them have two digits percentage points of inflation. And once people understand that, and again, I, I, would, I would say 70, 80 percent of people don't understand that. Once they understand this problem, the natural reaction for them is, hmm, what's the solution? Like, we need to have a solution. I want a way out of this. And then is that's where the people that you talk to, the newcomers, and that's usually after like five minutes of conversation uh, when they understand about what's wrong with the financial system, 
is what the, where, where they are triggered, where they're interested in, okay, what's, what is the solution? What could be the solution, you know? And then they're actually listening to you. And then you get, you get them with, well, one solution could be Bitcoin, because if you compare Bitcoin, and if, if you conceptualize it as a sound money, and you compare it to other monies that we knew forms of money uh, that we used for saving value, like for example gold, which we as humanity used for thousands of years as a store of value, and fiat, which is actually a derivative of gold, or it has been until um, the gold cap was, uh, was not official anymore in, in the beginning of the 70s. Um, then if you compare it uh, to characteristics that a good store of value should have, and this is what research from the, the, the Fed brings up, and also it, this, gra this very graph is actually not from Relay, we, we stole it, it's from <laughs> Fidelity, Fidelity Investment, one of the uh, oldest and largest financial institutions in the world. They released a paper where they have this graphic, where they define what are the most important characteristic a sound money and a store of value needs to have, ideally, in order to work, and they compare it to, they compare Bitcoin to gold and fiat. So, first of all, it needs to be scarce. Fiat currency is not scarce. 40% of the US dollars that are in circulation today have been printed in the last year. So it can be just printed, printed. It's not, it's not scarce at all. Gold is pretty scarce, but Bitcoin is actually scarcer because it's, it's, it's fixed. There's 21 million, there's never gonna be more. With gold, there's a probability you find some tons of gold in Uganda. It actually happened. Uh, and Or you find some gold on Mars and on other planets. That could happen. Then all of a sudden there's more gold. With, with, with Bitcoin, this can happen because there's only 20 million. So it's the most scarce asset that we have ever seen. It's very easy to devise from one Bitcoin to 100 millionth of Bitcoin. It's called a SAT. Stacks, stack sets. Um, and you can also put it back together to 1 million Bitcoin if you, if you want. Like it's very easy digitally. With gold, this is super hard. You need to kind of have you ever tried to cut gold? It's pretty hard. Um, it's, it's portable, super easy to send money from here, from Lugano with Bitcoin to uh, somewhere, you know, Senegal or, uh, or, you know, El Salvador, whatever super easy, within a couple of seconds, almost cost me nothing. Try to send gold to Senegal today, or even fiat money. It's actually easier and faster to send fiat money in an envelope with an with a, uh, airplane to Senegal than to send it with a bank, because it takes like two weeks. And all of these things, you know, you can go through it uh, yourself, but it's like the, the bottom line of this is that not only me, but most of the Bitcoin community and uh, Fidelity and also others come to the conclusion that Bitcoin is the best store of value and the best money that we have ever invented as humans. And that's pretty exciting as a solution for the problem that we just discussed. That's just to show like the, uh, the scarcity uh, to uh, the scarcity argument. And this is also the reason why it actually has been the best performing asset of the last 10 years. If you compare it to gold, if you compare it to stocks, if you compare it to other fiat currencies. And that's why the investors that have taken this step to understand Bitcoin and did their research, they want to invest in Bitcoin. And that's usually how it goes. A problem then there's the solution, then there's the desire of, fuck, and you really need to invest in Bitcoin. And it's not only s one uh, certain part of society, it's almost everyone. It's retail investors, especially the younger generations. So this is a survey that um, they did with uh, people that already invest their money in stocks or whatever else. And they, almost half of the generation Z, so up to 20 year old people, young people, um, uh, say they want to invest or they already invest in Bitcoin and other crypto assets. Millennials uh, they, they are people between 20 and 
35 years old is actually the biggest consumer group today already and it's going to be the biggest investor group in the next 10 to 20 years so these are the people it's in my age between 20 and 20, uh, 35 that will earn and inherit and control through leadership uh, positions at institutions the majority of the money in the world like the the bosses of investment banks the bosses of family offices, the CEOs of the next big tech startups, they're all millennials now. So they will control all the money. And if, they s and if almost half of them say they will invest in Bitcoin, well, guess what? There's going to be a lot of money flowing into Bitcoin, which is scarce. So the demand will be huge in the next 10 years, but the supply is scarce. Guess what this is going to do with the price? which will generate even more FOMO. Not only retail investors, though, and not only young people, but also institutional investors and old people are interested in Bitcoin. You know what, who this guy is? Larry Fink. Larry Fink. What, is he, what is he doing? What's his role? Uh, BlackRock. BlackRock. This is one of the most wealthy and probably also one of the most powerful people in the world because as you say CEO of BlackRock BlackRock is the biggest um, asset manager in the world managing a bit more than 10 trillion US dollars um, I don't know how many zeros there are behind this 10 but it's a lot so he's managing a majority of um, institutional money in this world and he got into Bitcoin uh, with um, BlackRock, so they now offer all their institutional clients a very easy way to invest in Bitcoin. So you can also imagine what this will do to the demand and the money flowing in in the next 10 years. So Bitcoin and crypto adoption is um, going on, but still it's super early. So if you compare it to the internet, when the internet came up in 1998, before Facebook or Amazon or Google or any of these were even really on the market. They, there were 300 million internet users in the world. So before the whole dot-com bubble and everything happened, there were 300 million users, not nothing, but it's also not really a lot. If you look at internet users today, it's in the billions, like two, three, maybe even four billions. And exactly the same amount are now into Bitcoin. Around 300 million people are into Bitcoin. Sounds like a lot, but it's actually not a lot. There's a lot of development and improvement uh, coming in the next couple of years. You are super early still. If Bitcoin was a company, it already has a kind of a size, so it would already be one of the top 10 or top 20 companies right now in terms of market capitalization. So it is already quite big, but it's going to be like 10x uh, of what it is now. This is what investors think about and what gets investors going, like this huge potential that lies in front of them. Like if you now invest 5 or 10% of your portfolio in Bitcoin, what can you lose? If it goes to zero, you can lose 5 to 10%. But if this all happens how we think it will happen, that all the monetary energy in the world flows into this, with a huge demand and a, a fixed supply, then what could potentially happen is you make a 10x or 100x um, return. So that's what we call an asymmetric return profile of an asset. Like you can own, only lose so much, but you can make so much potentially. That's again what investors obviously like. And then at one point they say, okay, 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 I'm, I'm convinced. Uh, I now want to buy Bitcoin. How do I do it? And the answer is, it depends. Depends what kind of investor you are. Do you are you just a normal person uh, that you know has a saving rate of ten to twenty percent per month? So you're earning. If you're in Switzerland, if you're an average person, you're earning five to six k per month, and you're putting aside ten to twenty percent of this as savings. And right now you're putting it on, the, on a, on a uh, savings account with your bank and you're losing money every year because of inflation, because of high um, uh, cost and low interest rates. So if you were to put this 
uh, in into like these are a couple of hundred maximum maybe 1k per month you're a retail investor small investor normal person and you would probably use either relay or coinbase depending on they're both really easy to use um, but depending on if you care to hold your assets yourself this is what we call non-custodial or if you feel safer to have some sketchy internet company from the US holding your Bitcoin. So it's everyone's choice. Um, but if you if you want to get your Bitcoin, your, you, you can control it. Then you can use something like Relay and within one minute you can buy your first Bitcoin and you get it. And you can set up a savings plan, for example, of these 10 to 20 percent every uh, month. And then you can get the Bitcoin directly to your wallet that you control. No one else, not even Relay has access to them. With, with Coinbase, you can all of do all of that too. You can also buy other uh, cryptocurrencies and speculate on them. doesn't really have a lot to do with savings anymore. And there's quite some KYC AML onboarding you need to do. And you need to trust these people to hold your money. They can, it can be freezed, it can be censored, transactions can be blocked and everything. That's just something you need to keep in mind. Now, if you're an institution like a big bank or a family office or an asset manager, uh, or a high net worth individual, uh, you know, maybe you earned 100 million by selling your company or something like that. It's kind of a different story because then it's, you can still um, hold your money yourself. That's on the bottom right. For example, you can work with a service provider like Crypto Finance here in Switzerland. Um, they are really uh, focused on institutions and serving institutions and they help institutions to hold their money themselves, stuff like Multisig, for example, they do a lot of advice. They have different text setups also with hardware, hardware modules, security modules, um, because as an institution, you know, managing millions, you need to make some other thoughts than just a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand bucks as a private person. You can also indirectly um, invest in, in Bitcoin, for example, with something like 21 shares also in Switzerland with them you're not holding your Bitcoin also as an institution, but you basically invest in a, uh, in, a, in a certificate that just tracks the price of Bitcoin and you can book it into your portfolio. This is what a lot of ho uh, high net worth individuals like. They already have a stock portfolio and they can just book in with an IC number very easily for a high price though, um, some Bitcoin or some synthetic Bitcoin into their portfolio. There, again, you have the counterparty risk. So whenever 21 shares or the according bank, banks will go bust or stop paying out money, which is now also happening some, sometimes in uh, Germany or used to happen in Greece, then uh, you're also not in control anymore. So it really depends whether you're a retail or an institutional investor, whether you want to control your money or not. And then there's many, many... Um, different service providers that you can use out there. That's kind of how you should think about what to use and also what to recommend to your people that you are, to the newcomers that you're getting into this. Now we can buy some Bitcoin. Now you can take off your phone and buy if you want. Or we can have time for some questions if you want. We have like 15 minutes left. Yes? Yeah. And how can we invest in uh, Bitcoin? Yeah. Because we have the bills to pay and uh, yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I remember when I was a student, I was like, I was broke every end of the month. But I sometimes I think like 10 or 20 bucks you might still have. Mm -hmm. This is enough to start. Like with, with Relay, you, you need 10 bucks to start. And it costs you almost nothing. It costs you like 10 cents per transaction. So if you have 10 bucks every month, you should start now because these 10 bucks that you're putting in now, like every month, they add up. And so in 10 years from now, when Bitcoin is maybe at 1 million per coin, you know, until then you might have 0 0.1 Bitcoin. So this could be 100K. You can buy, you can buy maybe not a Lamborghini, but you can buy a nice car with it. 
<laughs> yes, sir. How will it be then a means of payment if if it's denominated so much a million? As a means of payment. Yeah, I mean if you if you say you want to buy something, I don't know, a meal or something, you have to yeah. calculate it out to so many zeros. Is it going to be let's say a, a breakdown mechanism so that the average person can think this yeah. cost me one unit of this? Absolutely, yeah. Hmm. So right now, and this can be changed in the future if the value is super high. But right now, one bitcoin equals to one hundred million sats. So sats is like the smallest unit that there is. 100 million sats equal one Bitcoin. So if uh, you know a Bitcoin is one million, then a coffee will only be you know maybe 10 sats or something like that. I don't know, I'm making these numbers up, but like you can always have the, the very small units. And we can even adapt this. So in the code of Bitcoin, this can be changed so that there are even 100, 100 billion of whatever satoshis or whatever this will be called then in the app today does it show the sats you can stat switch well? to sats yeah okay, yeah you can Thank switch you. from from bitcoin like if you have 0 0.1 bitcoin you can switch to sats and then you have all of a sudden you have 10 million of sats so you're a sats millionaire most of our users are congratulations there is another question yeah Sorry, next next to you. Hi. Hey. Uh, you all the exchanges that you mentioned are KYC, right? So I, I think you didn't touch the non KYC mm -hmm. aspect here of invest investment. Could you quickly elaborate on, on, on that? Yeah, of course. So there's um, the the traditional exchanges that we know, like the big ones like Coinbase and Binance and Bitpanda, they are full KYC. So that means you need to uh, sign up for an account, you give away your email address, your name, your address, you need to upload uh, a proof of where you live, a utility bill or something, and you need to upload an ID. So you basically almost need to open like a bank account or something. Like you, you know, they know everything of you. Then there are middle ways where you do, you know, not full KYC, uh, like Relay, you can download it and you can start right away. You don't need to upload any documents or you don't even need to give us your name or your email address. Uh, keep in mind though that when you send us money with your credit card or your bank account, there's always your name and your address delivered with the payment. So it's not that you're anonymous, we still know your name uh, and your address and your bank details, but that's it. So you don't need to upload an, uh, um, uh, any documents with us where if we get hacked, these get leaked. You know, mm. This happens to Coinbase and Bitpanda and all these guys. Um, this cannot happen uh, with us, which is good. And then there's an extreme case of uh, services like BISC or HODL HODL or ATMs where you can buy peer-to-peer -peer online or with cash offline. Bitcoin and these are then really no KYC. So these are anonymous and you have the Bitcoin. No one can ever find out if you not if you don't tell anybody. No one can find out that you have these Bitcoin. But they are usually this is harder to use and more expensive. There is one back there. Yes. Thank you. Your underlying message was is striking. Is clearly uh, probably the majority of people here is straightforward, compelling. But why the focus on blockchain, um, specifically for the presentation? Because in essence, you could have done the same presentation for across the the cross the crypto assets portfolio, any kind of crypto cryptocurrency. Particularly, the reason why I'm asking it is, what's your position about the unsustainable consensus mechanism of Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. So I'm making friends here in the audience, <laughs> but is why invest That's in good. Bitcoin because of this and not mm -hmm. stake, uh, stake uh, the other the power of uh, consensus, uh, uh, no, the proof of stake uh, consensus mm -hmm. uh, tokens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, good, good point. You, you're right. You're not going to make friends, but it's, it's fine. It's good. It's good to have contrarian arguments. Um, look, I believe after being in this space for seven years, I believe that Bitcoin is fundamentally different from all these other 20,000 different cryptocurrencies. If you look at, um, did I hear shitcoins? No, 
language. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you look at uh, all of these other coins and you know the top 10 in the last 10 years, the top 10 of the biggest cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin was always first and is still first. And all the others are basically coming and going. So most of the, the coins that were in the top 10 five years ago, 10 years ago, are now irrelevant. They're somewhere in the hundreds or even thousands in the rank orders. Um, and they look more, if you look from an investment point of view, they look more like startups. So they're using a nice technology, a new technology like blockchain or any other. Um, like th They have ideas for DeFi, for NFT, and they kind of uh, have some return on investment if you stake them. And so very, very, you know, some of them are innovative. Some of them are scams. Um, uh, some of them are just not thought through. So they're, they're startups. They're trying something. Um, I'm not going to say they're all going to go away, but it's as you were to invest in a startup, in, an, in a team that is pretty centralized and that use a nascent technology, uh, it's nine out of ten will not make it long term. Maybe one will make it and you can make a 100x. If you, if you invest in the next meme coin, like in the next Shiba Inu coin, for example, for any reason you might make 100x. Um, but this is more speculation than saving. It's, it's not long-term investing, it's short-term gambling. So I think this is really important to understand for, for people that there's a difference between Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. I'm not saying one is bad, but it's just, it's just very different. When it comes to the sustainability aspect, do you mean like ecologically unsustainable? Or what do you mean not sustainable? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You're right, Bitcoin uses quite a lot of uh, energy, which I think is not necessarily a bad thing. If it, it, Yes, it does use energy, but if you compare it to other things that also use energy, like the traditional financial system, including the banking system, including the, uh, the printing press of physical banknotes, including uh, bit, uh, not Bitcoin mining, but gold mining, like how much energy it, it takes to take gold out of the soil and then somewhere else you put it into the soil again, which is pretty stupid already. So, but this, this uses like five, six, even 10 times more, depending on how you measure it, more energy. Then YouTube. YouTube is using more energy than Bitcoin mining, like double or triple. Um, Christmas lights in December in the US use more energy than Bitcoin. So it's always, uh, you know, it always depends. You need to compare uh, what you think energy is wise spent or not. Then it's not necessarily bad to use energy, especially if it's, if it's energy coming from a sustainable source. And most of the Bitcoin mining energy actually currently is between 50 and 70%. The trend is upwards is already coming from sustainable energy sources. Like for example, in Iceland, miners can go wherever they want. They always go where uh, the energy is cheap and energy is usually cheap where it's uh, available in surplus and uh, being made with sustainable methods like thermal energy in Iceland or water energy or wind energy. Um, so I believe that in 10 years we will actually have uh, a super sustainable energy mix uh, for the Bitcoin mining. So I don't see a big problem there. The big problem is that Bitcoin has a PR problem because no one ever asked why is YouTube um, using so much energy. Have you ever read in the magazine that YouTube is using too much energy and is boiling the oceans? No. But for Bitcoin, yes, you read that. So we have a PR, ag uh, a PR agency. We have a PR problem here. I think, but it's not necessarily uh, any other problem.